This lecture is on diffusion and cascades in networks, and this will round out our discussion about dynamic networks and temporal aspects of social media. So the goals for this lecture are to introduce cascades, describe several kinds of cascade models, and introduce some graph features that influence the propagation of information in these graphs. So first, in terms of defining information cascades, what is a cascade? So given some network, a contagion will spread in this network, and cascades define how this contagion spreads. And we have examples like diseases and memes, how diseases spread in real networks or social networks, how memes spread in social networks, viral marketing, how information spreads both on and offline, uh, the uh, goal of many marketing campaigns, uh, power overloads. So you may hear about propagation of a power overload or power failure in one transfer substation, then propagates to other substations, causing a large-scale blackout. Uh, or traffic congestion as well, where congestion in one small part of the network has a cascade effect that causes ca congestion further down the line. When we refer to the cascade, we're talking specifically about the spread in the graph. So what parts of the graph are uh, infected by the ca contagion or subject to uh, influence by a particular contagion, something like that, rather than the whole graph. So the idea is you have some initial point of infection or some initial uh, early adopter, and that behavior spreads or that, that contagion spreads through the network over time. And there are a lot of related areas that um, propagation and cascades and networks sort of steal from. So network propagation from bioinformatics, for example, or epidemiology are good examples of the use of cascades for other fields. Or more timely, there's been a lot of talk about COVID-19 bubbles, especially now in the time around Thanksgiving, where people tracing their COVID or tracing their contact bubbles see that actually their bubbles are much wider than they may anticipate. So if one person is infected or, or infectious uh, or contagious with COVID-19, that infection can propagate through these bubbles very quickly. So when we're talking about cascades, there are two main questions that come up. Uh, one is how does a cascade propagate or how do we model that? Which really reduces to how does the number of infected nodes in a given graph uh, grow or shrink over, t over time? And then uh, more importantly, I guess depending on, what your, on uh, what your perspective is and what your context is, what stops a cascade in terms of graph structure or uh, behavior? Now, when I've done this, this module in class uh, or in person, the way we did this, we had a, an activity called the Terra Plague, where we broke the class into two teams. We have the bioterrorist team, whose role is to pick three nodes in a graph to infect with the objective of infecting as many as possible. And we have some medical response team uh, who has the opposite job, where they pick three nodes to immunize on the graph who won't get infected and the objective is to save as many people as possible, and then you get to take turns picking nodes. So the bioterrorist team can't pick three nodes, or three nodes, and the medical response team picks three nodes. Instead, it has to be a sort of give and take. The bioterrorist team picks one, the medical response team picks one. It's sort of similar to the board game Pandemic, but with a more uh, mechanic or a more human-driven mechanical aspect. So if, when we do this in class, we use the risk map that, that I've shown you before. And given this graph, some of the questions you may ask are, you know, what made you choose a particular node? Uh, you as the bioterrorist team, you know, how do you want to see your information spread or propagate as far as possible? Uh, maybe this is a disease, maybe it's some viral marketing campaign. Or if you're the, the medical response team, you want to stop this spread very quickly. So how do you identify which nodes are the most valuable to you? Now, given some, some uh, graphic like the map, it may be difficult to interpret or identify what these important nodes are graphically, depending on what your metrics are for being quote unquote important. So really what do we care about when we talk about the metrics here? Uh, is there a way to look at or to generate a metric or construct a metric that helps us find nodes that are important? And the reality is we've already seen an answer to this question. So we've seen centrality metrics that we've talked about a number of times. So we've seen degree centrality, closeness, between this and eigenvector centrality. And all of these are different ways to rank the importance of a node. Uh, so then the question becomes, well, which one of these is maybe the most important? How do, how do these centrality metrics relate to diffusion? So if we look back at the risk board, then we can say, well, what are the, the uh, nodes with highest degree centrality? 
Well, there are five of them that are all of uh, degree six, uh, so they're all tied for the top, Ukraine, Middle, a Middle East, China, East Africa, North Africa. So you may try and infect these nodes or, or immunize these nodes because they can uh, infect very many people in one, one quote-unquote round, or uh, round as it were. Alternatively, we could use high closeness centrality, where the Middle East, Afghanistan, and Ukraine are the three nodes with highest closeness centrality. And maybe this would be the best kind of metric for this for this task, where closeness centrality is, remember, is defined as uh, the general shortest path from this node to all other nodes. So it would be the fewest number of turns to infect nodes from Ukraine or nodes from the Middle East. Between the centrality we are bridging nodes, so these may be really good nodes for the medical team to inoculate because these nodes are sort of gateways to other places. So uh, this is particularly clear in North Africa where if you immunize North Africa and then you've sort of sanctioned off uh, or protected South America uh, for infection to get to South America then has to propagate to North America first. It gives you more time to inoculate. And then eigenvector centrality is kind of an interesting one uh, where Middle East, Southern Europe, and Ukraine are, are clustered together as having high eigenvector centrality. Now, again, eigenvector centrality being defined as nodes that are close to nodes of, uh, that themselves have high centrality. So you could imagine doing some simulation where if you infect these three nodes and see how it goes, there's maybe, it's maybe less clear how to, how to intuit what will happen here. But really the question is, how well does this work? Now we can do this through simulation. We could play this out uh, through the class, um, which is what we would do if we were in person. But we can, absent the ability to play with the, the, the map and sort of game out what the scenarios are, can we use models that help us predict spread? And in what different kinds of situations can uh, we model that give us a better insight into particular kinds of spread? And if we can do this, if we can figure out what these models are, then we can choose nodes to target in some uh, more formalized way, rather than just saying, well, this is the top ranking, so we think these are, are important. And this is where cascade models come into play. So when I talk about cascade models, uh, we can think about them in terms of probabilistic models around epidemiology. So this is a good way to think about it, given COVID-19, and they, you have a, like a more uh, connected feeling to this right now but really will steal these kind of models where an infected node pushes some infection to its neighbors. Uh, that the only way a particular node gets infected is if that node is in contact with uh, another node. There is some edge between that node and another node that is itself infected. And then these edges allow the information or infection or viral marketing or whatever to spread from node to node. So we'll talk about four main models that help us understand this spread. Uh, the first one is a, is a somewhat simplistic but very popular and has a very storied uh, history is the SI model. We also have K threshold models, uh, models of collective action, and payoff based models. So these are increasing, increasingly sophisticated models. So the SI model. Uh, the SI in the SI model stands for susceptible or infected, where you have some network structure. And at the beginning of life, all of the nodes in your network are susceptible to this to some contagion, be it a disease or uh, a meme, a new idea, anything along those lines. And then at some point in time or after some amount of time, some of these nodes become infected. And then how this spreads uh, from the infected nodes to susceptible nodes becomes the, the quantity of interest. And we can parameterize this by saying, at the beginning of time, all nodes in our graph are susceptible. And then the main parameter is the transmission rate where we have trans some transmission rate P uh, that is some stochastic process that determines whether a, an infection or contagion spreads from an infected node to a susceptible neighbor. Uh, the higher that P value, the more likely it is that at some time step, this infection or contagion will spread. And then we can model this as a dynamic graph that we talked about last time, where at each keyframe or at each time step, then Every, for every edge that an infected node has, we essentially roll some die, uh, roll some die, like hundred-sided die, and then evaluate our value compared to this p, and see if that infected node transmits to the susceptible node. And there are other versions of the SI model 
out there as well. So there's SIS, which is susceptible and infected, and susceptible. So in the SI model generally, once you become infected, then you're infected for all time. Uh, you cannot become reinfected. Now maybe you, the, the model is you die, or you have adopted some idea, or been exposed to some idea, or something else. The SIS model is, is slightly more sophisticated, so we can model that you are originally susceptible, you become infected, and then after some amount of time, you lose the infection status and return to susceptible. There's the SIR model, which is susceptible and infected like we've seen before, but then once you're infected, after some period of time where you're contagious and spread the disease, then you transition to a recovered or resistant state where you cannot get the infection again. You can imagine many diseases uh, fit into this, into this kind of model, where once you're infected and recovered or exposed somehow, then you cannot get the disease nor can you pass it on. And you can add on to this as well. So there's the SIRS model where you're susceptible and infected, then you have some period where you're resistant, and then you transition back to susceptible again, which is potentially where COVID-19 fits in, where once you are infected with COVID-19, if you get over it, then you're, you become resistant for some period of time, uh, and then you transition back to susceptible. And there are others as well that allow you to become more sophisticated. And the real question here is given some parameter P, that we've talked about, what happens with the full with the full graph? Uh, in the most simplistic version, as the number of time steps increases, the longer the the infection or the contagion persists, uh, the higher the likelihood of the entire graph becoming infected. So then, with SI models, the interesting question isn't so much how many nodes become infected but at what rate do nodes become infected. You make some assumption that eventually everybody becomes exposed uh, or infected to some degree based on what you mean by infected. And the question is, how many time steps did that take? Now, in contrast, we have k-threshold models, where rather than having some, some parameterized value that says for some given uh, infectious agent or some contagion with some parameter p, we pin the infection or contagion to an individual node, where we have some node V, some vertex V, who has neighbors, and the vertex V decides to take on some action if and only if the number of friends around that node also take that action. So we have some threshold value where if I'm connected to five other nodes, if more than two of those nodes or more than three of those nodes take some action, and I too will take some action. So this is much more uh, deterministic, and mechanical, where we know exactly what will happen. And you could imagine this applies in social networks uh, pretty easily. So it, in Twitter, Twitter will tell you for a given tweet how many people have how many people of your friend group or your friends have retweeted or liked this tweet. And then you can say, well, if some threshold number of my friends, some uh, integer value number of my friends have taken some action, then I too should probably take this action. I'll retweet this tweet if more than two friends also have retweeted it, or I'll like this tweet if more than two friends have, have themselves liked it. Which leads to a number of interesting kinds of behaviors, like people adopting the fidget spinners, where you know, once enough of my friends are all playing with fidget spinners, I kind of want one myself, uh, or leads to some more kind of strange or bizarre behaviors like chia pets. Uh, where if I see them in enough spaces where I see enough of my friends have one, then I kind of want one. Uh, fashion also has some relationship here where if we look back to 90s fashion, maybe we don't understand exactly what was going on, but you can imagine this being driven by some K-threshold kind of model where I look around my school and see uh, many of my friends are wearing a particular kind of outfit or uh, in the case of Dwayne Johnson, a fanny pack, and do I then think, well, oh, if lots of people are doing it, this must be cool, so I should adopt this as well, or at the very least, if I don't adopt this behavior, then I will start to stick out. So in the simplistic model for k thresholds, we have a uniform value k for all nodes in the graph, so basically every node in the graph has the same threshold, uh, where I have to see k friends do some, some uh, behavior before I uh, adopt some behavior. But we get more sophisticated with this as well, where we can have a k value at the individual node level that's maybe drawn from some specific distribution or some pre-specified distribution, which lets us integrate some more stochasticity into the or randomness into the graph. And as we do that, we get more interesting cascade behaviors, because 
you might imagine that some uh, different kinds of nodes have, should, should likewise have different thresholds, uh, so, which we'll see in just a moment. When we talk about Granovetter's model of collective action. So you've already re read some paper, uh, some papers by Granovetter that I assigned early on in the semester. So he also has this idea of collective action, where given some fully connected graph of, of nodes, where I see what all of my friends are doing, uh, each node in the graph has the option to adopt one of two behaviors. I can do option A, or I can do option B. And maybe by default, everybody chooses op option A, and B is this new option. Then we have a threshold for adoption, where every, uh, every node has some individual threshold. And we specify this threshold as, I will adopt this new option B, if and only if, the global number of, of nodes in the graph who have adopted this, this new option uh, is greater than some value or the ratio of the total number of nodes that have adopted B in this graph over the total number of nodes in general is above some, some threshold value. So we can pin this between zero and one and say if some percentage of the graph has adopted this new behavior, I too will adopt this new behavior. So we can specify this, we can model it as f of x is some fraction of the population whose threshold is below or is less than or equal to this x value. And we have this other idea or this other, this other function s of t where that says the number of nodes or rather the fraction of nodes, the percentage of nodes participating in this uh, new option, uh, option b, at this particular time frame. And then here we get to two different kinds of nodes. We have early adopters, those nodes who have a relatively low threshold that it doesn't take very many nodes in the graph to adopt this behavior before I want to adopt this behavior. And we see this with Apple's iPhone, which is probably one of the, the quintessential examples of early adopters. But we also see this with new social networks. So Facebook and, and Twitter are the common ones, but as Snapchat rolls out or as Instagram rolls out, you have to have some uh, nexus point or some critical mass of people who have moved to this new platform before this platform becomes of value to the larger population. And maybe those early adopters are going to be those people who move to this new platform. They don't need very many people to adopt this new platform before they too adopt it. And in contrast, we have late adopters or people who have relatively high thresholds. They need to see many of their, of the of a large portion of the population adopt this behavior before they then adopt this behavior. In terms of how we model this, we can do this in discrete time steps where at time step one, this many, uh, this many nodes have adopted this behavior at time step two, at time step three, and so on. And nodes do not individually make this decision. That This decision happens across all nodes in the graph at a particular time step. So then we can ask questions about this kind of model. Uh, when does a decision spread? So we can model this in terms of general growth, where we have S of zero, or S zero of zero, which is how many nodes have adopted this behavior at time step zero. Currently, nobody. Uh, at time step one, we can say the number of nodes or the fractional component of nodes who have adopted this behavior is however many nodes have a threshold of zero. At S2, we can say the number or the fraction of nodes who have adopted this behavior is actually the fraction of nodes who have a threshold set of S1. We do this uh, recursively saying F of F0 and so on. So we can do at, any, at, in, at an nth moment of time, uh, we can define this as this recursive uh, structure of the fractional number of nodes that adopted this, this behavior at the nth time step uh, is reliant on the previous time step. So we get this nice uh, Markovian structure. And we can simulate this relatively easily. So at our first time step, or at the zeroth time step, no node has adopted this new behavior. But at the first time step, we go look at our table and say, well, how many nodes in the graph have a threshold of less than or equal to zero? And we get one. So this top node here, node one, has a threshold of zero. So this node is very quick to adopt new options or new behaviors the moment they come out. At the next time step, we look at, well, how, what's the fraction of nodes who have a threshold of 3 sevenths or less, which is about 0.42 or so. Uh, 
And we get these three nodes, so nodes two, three, and four all have a uh, threshold below this value. And then we can move on to time step three. Well, how many nodes have a threshold of four sevenths or below? And uh, no other nodes, so five, six, and seven all have thresholds of uh, above 0.57, so they're not gonna adopt this new behavior. So at, at time step four, there is no change. At time step five, there's no change. And in fact, this spread has halted at this point where no new nodes are gonna adopt this, this behavior despite how long we um, allow this network to propagate. So there's good mathematical models around collect the collective action model where we can plot out the uh, or compare the spread, the fractional component of, of nodes that have adopted some behavior versus the uh, straight line and we can see the time stamps or the time steps as we go up and what happens or the interesting points here is this fixed point at what point in time does our f of x function cross this x uh, this x equals y uh, 45 degree line and we actually can separate these into regimes where as long as our f of x function is above this line then our cascade will grow over time but the moment we hit this this fixed point, then our cascade starts to shrink. And the only way we can push beyond that is by actively incentivizing early adopters or adding some new uh, new behavior to the graph, either through payment or some other, some other behavior. We spent more time talking about the collective action model than we did about the SI model or the K threshold model um, because it has more interesting kinds of dynamics, but it still isn't perfect, right? So there are definitely weaknesses here. So first, uh, one of the assumptions that we make in the collective action model is that I as a node in the graph can see behaviors or choices of all other nodes in the graph, which is almost certainly not, not true, right? So the full world, I can't see the decisions of the full world. I can only really see decisions in my local network. And likewise, an interesting kind of behavior in, in the collective action model is that it doesn't tell us what happens with peer pressure. Uh, or the surprising aspects therein. So it turns out if you look at the behaviors around sort of, or the responses to kind of odd behaviors, uh, how a few people can lead the larger group uh, ends up being surprisingly, uh, surprisingly informative or su su uh, has surprising dynamics to it. And you can imagine this in a classroom setting where somebody gives a presentation and after that person has finished their presentation, uh, it may be silent for a minute before one or two people start to clap. Those one or two people are very much early adopters. But then what happens is those few people who are early adopters, the first people to clap, sort of start this cascade of many people clapping. But then at the end, there are people who are bringing in additional information that if they don't clap, that must, that must mean or that will carry some signal about how they feel about this thing and they then feel pressed into doing something. So there are weaknesses here in the collective action model. So we can go on to the next model, the last one we'll talk about, which is about payoff-based cascades, where we violate the assumption from the collective action model and say there's some incomplete graph, I don't get to see everybody, and a particular node in the graph gets to choose some option based only on that nodes, neighbors. So I don't see everybody. Everybody, I look at my neighbors and what my neighbors' choices are and take some action based on what my neighbors' decisions are. And for every pair of nodes, uh, so this node i or vertex v, uh, for every pair of them, I get some payoff for some decision. So if the two, if the two of us have, if myself and some neighbor node, have decided on the same action, we get some payoff a. Uh, if I've decided on another action, but both of us have decided on that other action, we get some payoff B. And the only time that we get no payoff is if we don't agree on some action. So if two no, if uh, my neighbor and I don't agree on a particular action, and we take, we each take different actions, so we get zero payoff. So then we can look at the graph and look at the pairs of nodes. So for this vertex V, I can, I can look and see, well, what's the payoff I get from this node, from this node, from this neighbor, from this neighbor, and from this neighbor. So then the question becomes, how do I choose what option to take, knowing that I can choose option A or B, and I can see what my neighbors are doing? So we can parameterize this and say, if I have some set of neighbors D, 
and some fraction of them, p, have chosen option a, then I can start to work this out numerically. And I, what I want to do clearly is maximize my payoff. So if I count up the number of times I agreed with my friends versus the number of times I disagreed with my friends, then I want the payoff from agreement from those times where I've agreed to be as high as possible. So what does this look like? If I have, if I choose to adopt some action A, then I have the payoff from A, then I have the fraction of my friends P who have adopted A, and then I have all of my neighbors D. So that A times P times D, that, that product gives us our payoff if we choose A. And conversely, we have the payoff for B, which is the, or pay, the payoff of choosing option B, which is B's payoff, little b, times the number of no neighbors I have, D, but times one minus P, that is the number of, of neighbors I have, or the fraction rather of neighbors that I have who didn't choose option A. And then we just we take the maximum of this. So we choose the, the option that maximizes this payoff. And we can simplify this to say I'll only choose option A if and only if this A times P times D product is greater than B times 1 minus P times D. So we can start to simplify this, where we have this inequality. We can rewrite it to get P is greater than B times 1 minus P times D divided by AD would the payoff of A times my number of friends, and we can simplify. So the only time I'll choose option A is if the fraction of friends who have chosen option A is greater than the payoff of B over the total payoff. So as long as the number of uh, friends I have who have chosen option A is greater than the proportion of payoff, uh, of B's payoff to the total possible payoff, then I'll choose option A. So yeah, V chooses A if P is greater than Q, so we rewrite this B over A plus B as Q. Now we have some new parameter. And we can start to ask questions about this graph. So if we have some initial graph where everybody has chosen option B, and we set the payoff for A at some payoff that's only slightly, slightly larger than the payoff for B, then we get some Q value, or we can set some Q value B over A plus B, we can rewrite that to b over b plus b plus this small additional value epsilon, which is approximately around, or should be very close to 0 0.5. And we get some interesting question here. So we have some hardwired set of, of early adopters, q and v. Uh, maybe we're paying them. Maybe they're just predisposed to this kind of behavior. And if we then try and simulate what will happen, then in this case, almost the entire graph will eventually adopt option a. Uh, we can do this time step by time stamp, or time step by time step rather. But interestingly, in this context, it doesn't matter what U or V does, these two nodes here in, in the corner will never switch over to option B. Or will never switch away rather from option B. They'll they'll always keep option B. They'll never they'll never choose option A. Uh, and it's because they have this use, that the only way this happens, the only way for these two nodes to be influenced is through node u. And if the value or the, the payoff of node u is not high enough to influence one or the other node, which it can't be based on this construct of a, the payoff for a being very close to the payoff for p, then these two nodes will generally not switch. So the questions around, or the interesting kinds of questions that arise from cascades and graphs is how many early adopters do I need to, to incentivize? Or how many early adopters are there going to be or do there, does there need to be in order for a cascade to take over the entire graph or as much of the graph as possible? So we call this, this phenomenon the cascade uh, with threshold Q, if and only if all nodes in, in our graph eventually adopt this behavior. Uh, so we can see this relatively clearly in a path graph where we have some early adopter u and we want to understand well, what is the maximum value of q that will allow this new behavior to spread throughout the graph. And you could imagine, well, if we break this down, every node in the graph has, has at most a degree 2. So we need to have the payoff for a be slightly, at least slightly higher than the payoff for B, uh, meaning that Q has to be less than or equal, or has to be strictly less than rather uh, one half. So this gives us ways to force adoption, right? So now 
Well, the, there's the easy but expensive way where we just pay everybody to take over. We take option A, or we pay everyone as though they're all early adopters, but that's prohibitively expensive. Or we can have the payoff for A be much greater than the payoff for B. Uh, so this could explain why Chrome took over Internet Explorer or why people moved away from Snapchat to Instagram once Instagram you know, instituted Reels uh, or Stories, these kinds of behaviors. We can go further here with the payoff graph and, sit and define this, this metric of cascade capacity, which is the largest Q value for which some early adopter set that's finite can cause a cascade in a particular graph. So capacity is a, is a feature of a particular graph. But interestingly, if we look at an infinite graph, or graphs that are sufficiently large, then no graph has a capacity greater than one half. What this means is, if we have sufficiently large graphs, uh, no amount of early adopters can cause a cascade if the payoff for A is less than B. Now, why is this? It turns out that, that even if you have uh, a large set of early adopters, if you assume some, fine, some infinite graph, then any sort of switching that may come about or oscillation that may come about by a node having to choose an option based on its neighbors eventually stops uh, as propagation ensues across the full graph. What this means is in order for a cascade to occur in arbitrary large graphs, then the payoff for a particular option must be strictly larger than the payoff for the alternative. Now the last thing we'll talk about is how do we stop cascades. So everything that we that we just talked about takes the perspective that cascades are, are something we want to achieve. Uh, if we are, this is especially useful in the social networking perspective where we are trying to uh, do some marketing or we're trying to track a propagation of a particular meme or a particular piece of information. But we can also take the flip side and say we want to stop a cascade because we want to stop some contagion, some, some virus, or we want to stop some rumor from spreading or stop some misinformation from spreading across the network. So how do we do that? When I talked about cascade capacity a moment ago, I said this is a feature of a graph or a feature of the network. We can look at the different kinds of networks that we've talked about and ask this question about, well, which ones are most susceptible to cascades or contagion? So some of the network models we've seen, there's the erdos Brinyi model, the Watts-Drogatz model, and the Verabasi albert model. And we can ask, well, which one of these is the most susceptible to spread? Or which one will result in the fastest total infection? So we want to understand, well, what stops or slows spread, spread here? Uh, from a simplistic standpoint, we can say that a graph or that a contagion will stop spreading in a graph when all nodes are infected or all nodes are dead or that there's some unconnected components, some subcomponents in the graph that are disconnected from all the rest of the world, and there's no way for an infection to jump from, from one connected component to another connected component. For slowing spreading, uh, we can say a high diameter, so if the maximal shortest path is really long, then the only way for the prop or for a contagion to propagate is by crossing a very long path, then this slows spread. So a high diameter slows spread. Likewise, if a network has low density, there's less opportunity to spread. What this means is I'm not, or most of the edges that could exist don't exist, so I can't jump very easily uh, to very many nodes. And then high local clustering, which is what we talked about uh, recently, makes it harder for contagion to spread because it has to invade these clusters or jump out of these clusters. So if, if a network has a particularly high local clustering coefficient, then these dense places that are not yet infected tend to stay uninfected. So if we look at diameter for these graphs, so we've talked about the diameter for the ER model is around log of n, so if n is the number of nodes, so that's relatively low in diameter, a relatively small diameter. So that means the erdos renyi graphs are going to be uh, more likely to have quick spread. The watt strogatz model is, is a rewiring of a regular graph, uh, of, a, of a ring graph. So it's going to, the rewiring was meant to provide this uh, low diameter. So it also has this diameter between log of n and, and uh, n over the number of edges that you have per node, or a degree per node. 
And then likewise with the Barabasi Albert model, you have generally a path length that's much lower or that's smaller than log of n. So here in all of these cases, we have some relatively quick distribution of, the, of a contagion. So then we can, we can start to rank these about resistance. So right, if we look at the ER model, uh, we have this parameter p that says what's the likelihood of, of a connection between any two nodes. If p is zero, well, there's going to be very slow to no spread uh, because nodes are unconnected. But if p times n minus 1, or the average degree in the ER model is less than 1, then we are going to still have slower spread because we have, we'll end up with, these, with many of these unconnected components throughout the graph. So you can't jump from one component to another. If the average degree is one, then we end up with this large connected component uh, where we have more opportunities for spread. And if we have the average degree is greater than one or, or at worst, maximally at one, at uh, p equals one means the whole graph is connected. So it's very easy to get from the infected node to any other node in the graph. The Barabasi Albert model, we have the parameter m, uh, which is the number of nodes a new node uh, is connected to with when it is introduced to the graph. For small m, we have slow spread, and for large m, we have high spread. So this is relatively straightforward. And for the, if we want to rank up the graphs that we've talked about, the D regular graph, which is the ring graph that we showed when we talked about the watt strogatz model, has probably the slowest spreading speed because it has the highest diameter. ER models with average degree greater than one, but with small p, will be slightly. Uh, We'll have slightly faster contagion. The Barabasi Albert model will be even faster, and then the ER model with large P or large connectivity uh, means it's the fastest to spread across the graph rapidly. Now we can revisit the SI model real, really quickly to talk about the late time SI model. So these models, or this model, comes into effect when we know that a particular contagion is infectious and eventually the whole graph becomes infected. So what we want to say is, or we want to understand is what happens when, uh, or after many time steps have, have occurred in the graph. So you may think of this, well, what, how long does it take for the entire graph to become infected uh, in, say, the pandemic game or the, the plague game? And we can talk about some special cases here. So the transmission probability is non-negative, and it's not zero. So uh, given enough time, a particular contagion may spread throughout the entire graph. There's a special case here for the ER model. Uh, when C, when the average degree is greater than or equal to 1, then all nodes in the graph are going to be generally connected to a single giant component, the giant connected component that I've mentioned before. So we can measure this and say the probability of large outbreaks of an outbreak covering the entire uh, giant connected component is equal to the size of that component over the number of, of nodes in the full graph. So the giant connected component may not be the full graph. Uh, it will generally be a, cover most of the nodes in the graph. But this tells us, well, the larger the giant connected component is, the more likely it is that a particular node becoming infected will be connected to this giant component and then eventually infect the full graph. There are also structures at play that can uh, completely stop cascades. And the main structure here are that of clusters. So we've already seen clusters before. We've, we saw an example a few slides ago where a cluster stopped a cascade. But really what happens here is clusters that are sufficiently dense and have some set of nodes means that the only way for uh, a contagion to spread into that node is if we somehow break this or get a payoff that's higher than this fraction of nodes. So here we have uh, two clusters that have some, some density among them of three-fifths and two-thirds. So even if we have uh, some set of early adopters, if the structure of this graph is uh, contains some cluster with a density that's greater than the p value that we decided before, this uh, value that must, this, this proportion of my neighbors who are infected or who have adopted this behavior. If we remove all of our early adopters and the resulting graph still contains a cluster 
uh, of density greater than this than this p-value, then no cl no cascade can form uh, that will take over this this graph. That particular cluster with that density will prevent spread into it. And we saw this before here, where this uh, pair of nodes here had a sufficiently high density that prevented the spread of, of this contagion into the cluster. So we'll end there. We've talked about a number of different kinds of cascade models. Uh, we've talked about what cascades mean, and we've talked about fa features of graphs that influence how quickly cascades spread through it, throughout them. And with that, we'll end our discussion of dynamic networks and contagion and propagation. Thank you very much.